Hello everyone, this is the Aperture Photometry Tool tutorial intro uh, to give you just a bit of a background on astronomical images and how we get information from astronomical images. So let's begin. Uh, what is an image? Well, first of all, there's nothing unique about, unique about an astronomical image. Uh, all images on film or in an electronic detector are recording of different brightnesses of light. And that's what we experience at any time, whether we watch it on television or uh, photograph. All of those are basically different brightnesses of light recorded in one form or another. Uh, I have to say that one thing that might confuse people is that there technically is and has never been a color photograph, by which I mean something that's recorded all of the different wavelengths simultaneously and then reproduced them simultaneously. Uh, there are some chips that are trying to do that today, but fundamentally, all present color images, whether they're taken by your digital camera on your phone or the expensive SLR that you got or from the Hubble Space Telescope, are a combination of several black and white images. So what is a black and white image? Well, a black and white image is basically, again, different levels of light recorded with the lowest level set at black, that is almost no light is black, and if there's more light, then that's white, or closer to being white. And here I've represented that in a grid, and you can think of those as pixels, where more light has fallen towards the center, and so that has a higher value and is whiter and brighter, while less light is falling on the edges, and so those tend to be darker and have lower values. And now here is an astronomical black and white image. This is a picture of the galaxy NGC 4051. It was recorded at 3.6 microns, and what you can see is that it's basically no different than any other image. The brighter regions have where more photons have fallen are brighter, the darker regions are black, there's less photons there. But the things to point out here are, for example, in addition to the galaxy, as you can see, there are other features which are not from the galaxy. This big black line in the middle, uh, the extended uh, little dots here, that's a cosmic ray hit. So all of this stuff has nothing to do with the NGC 4051 image, but they're also recorded on the detector. Now how you display the image is a different story. That is the same image, that is the same recorded information can be displayed differently, and this is often called a different stretch. So now we've emphasized the brighter aspects of this image, so we're showing things that are brighter, and we've made it so that the fainter things don't come up at all, they're all black, but you can see a lot more detail about the brighter points on the spiral arms of the galaxy, and you can see a lot closer to the core. Or we can change things and emphasize the fainter things and make them look brighter. Here you can see the core is now entirely blown out, the detail in the uh, spiral arms is a lot less, but you can see how far the spiral arms extend beyond what looked like initially. This is simply an extension of how you're displaying the image. What is recorded can be displayed in many different ways, and it's a good way to figure out what's there and what's not there. Now, here's the same galaxy imaged at four different wavelengths by the Spitzer Space Telescope, 3.6 micron, 4.5 micron, 5.8 micron, and 8 microns. And here you can see that the differences aren't solely in how the image was recorded, but there are inherent differences in the emission from this galaxy at these different wavelengths. For example, you can see there's a lot of stars here. Those are all these dots around the galaxy. Those are foreground stars. Uh, the galaxy itself, of course, has its own stars. But those foreground stars don't show up as much here. Why? Well, stars aren't as bright at 8 microns. While the spiral arms, although they exist in both images, they are much more prominent at 8 microns, so they're giving off a lot more light, which we're recording and displaying here, versus 3.6 microns. Now we can put all of these images together and make a color image, where we've assigned blue to the 3.6 micron channel, green to the 4.5 micron channel, and red to the 8 micron channel. And you can see how, for example, the stars are coming out bluer, and the spiral arms are coming out redder because they're more dominant at the longer wavelength. Now, this is often called a false color image, but there's nothing false about it. It's, just, it's simply an image that is representing the infrared colors, which our eyes would never see, with optical ones. So it's a representative color image. Uh, and what you can see is, you can, uh, going back to the black and white, is fundamentally what we've done is we've just represented it in a different way. 
Yet another way of representing the same image is doing it an inverse color, or in this case, an inverse black and white. Here, as you can see, our eyes tend to be more sensitive on picking up dark things on a bright background versus light things on a black background. So you can see actually a little bit more details here. This is also another way of representing the image, just like uh, representing, it in, representing it in color or in other ways. All of these are ways to better let you understand what you've actually imaged. So how do we get information from these images? Since the electronic detectors ultimately record the amount of light as numbers, the process to measure the amount of light is just a matter of adding numbers. So if we go back to our original grid of pixels here, each of the brightnesses is, in each pixel is represented by a value. And so what's the value of the central pixel image? Well, it's six. But is that an actual measurement of something physical? Is that real representative of what this image was imaging? Not really. The reality is that any optical system, whether it's your camera, Spitzer Space Telescope, Hubble Space Telescope, uh, has a finite limit on how small an image it can generate. This is how the optics and the atmosphere spread out the light from the point spread function uh, from the point, and hence that the point spreads out, and it's called the point spread function. On the left here, we have the Spitzer PSF, and this is a typical ground-based PSF. These little things coming off of it are having to do with the optical system, and this is what holds up the secondary mirror, and that scatters light, and so that gives you that structure there. On the ground, you have this. Again, that's the support structure of the secondary mirror of the telescope, but the, the reason it's blobbier is fundamentally because the atmosphere spreads things out. Uh, also, any image is the sum of the light from what you are imaging, in this case our star, and noise from your detectors, as well as light which is not from your object. A background from the sky or your telescope might be scattering some light like there. So uh, you also don't, that's not what your source is and you want to eliminate that. How do we go about this? And this is what's called the process of photometry. So when you're trying to do photometry, you're measuring the light from the point spread function and you want to make it, uh, include the whole point spread function but not all the extra stuff. So the main thing that you do is what you want to do is a radial profile. What's a radial profile? And basically it's this process of taking different annuli different rings and summing up the light that's in there. Going back to our original pixels here, uh, represented in this grid, you, the central pixel is 6, so that's a value of 6 on your radial profile. And then you take the next radius out, which is one pixel radius, and add those all up, and there's points over there, and then further out at two pixels, and they're all around one, so that's where you get so basically, a radial profile is the circularly average sum at increasing radial distances from the brightest point of the image. And so that's how you're trying to encase or get a good sense of what the, your point spread function is. The critical thing is also it shows where the PSF light ends and the non-PSF light dominates. And you can see here, it's starting to flatten out. And if we, in fact, pull out further, it becomes much more obvious how here we have our main point source, where its light is dominating, and you can see it over here. But then out here, it's not entirely black, because that's your sky contribution or your background contribution. So if you set up an annulus there, that ring, that, that's from that region there. That's your sky level. Notice that it's not at zero. There's some finite contribution, which is not from your PSF, that you want to take out. And that's where you set your sky level set sky level that, so that with your final combination at your final sum of all the pixels you get uh, this value of the point source. So that's basically photometry and that's how why the aperture photometry tool was developed. Uh, it's a Java based tool and so long as you have Java installed on your school's computer or your own computer you should be uh, able to run APT and if you're running a web browser usually you have Java and this tool gives you a lot more capabilities than um, to measure the light of the PSF and that'll the tutorial that Russ Lair has put and I encourage you to go and get the details on how to do to use APT. Thanks a lot for listening.